The aim of this module is to give you an understanding of the structure and function of normal human anatomy so that you can apply it in a practical setting. In this lecture we will discuss some of the fundamental topics of functional anatomy, ones that will enable you to go on and fulfil the module aims. We will discuss universally accepted anatomical terminologies and their application for the assessment of human structures. We will also briefly outline how to communicate with your subject to support clinical assessment. Obtaining a history and performing a standard physical examination of a stationary patient or client is often sufficient to develop a working differential diagnosis for a particular musculoskeletal injury or to support the assessment of athletic performance. Important reasons for assessing an individual's posture, their alignment at specific joints, their strength, range of motion, flexibility and gait allow us to identify potentially poor postural or locomotor mechanics which may contribute to their current symptoms, undermine their performance or predispose them to injury. These are the fundamental assumptions of functional anatomy assessment. Let us begin by deconstructing the approach to performing a valid and reliable assessment of functional anatomy. The examination of functional anatomy is best performed with the patient clothed, appropriately, so that the limbs and all important landmarks are easily seen. A t-shirt and running shorts work well for this. However, if we are assessing joints such as the shoulder, it may be necessary for the patient to remove an item of clothing. This should only be performed after explaining the purpose of the assessment to the patient and getting their consent. Indeed, appropriate communication with the patient is vital when conducting an assessment of functional anatomy, and this is something that we expect of you in a practical setting. An assessment typically begins with the patient standing in a relaxed position. Our systematic observation can be deconstructed into the anatomical planes of motion and the joint or body regions being observed. The anatomical planes of motion include the sagittal, frontal and transverse planes. The sagittal plane, also known as the longitudinal plane, is perpendicular to the ground and divides the body into left and right. A frontal or coronal plane is perpendicular to the ground and divides the body into dorsal and ventral portions. A transverse plane, also known as an axial or cross section, divides the body into cranial and caudal portions. It is parallel to the ground, which, in humans, separates the superior from the inferior or put another way, the head from the feet. When describing anatomical motion, these planes describe the axis along which an action is performed. For example, if a person flexed their shoulder at the glenohumeral joint, their shoulder would be moving through the sagittal plane. Now that we have covered the planes and axes of movement, we will now outline how to describe that movement. Two terms which you may be familiar with are extension and flexion. Extension occurs when the angle between two adjacent segments in the body increases as the ventral surfaces of the segments move away from each other and occurs in a sagittal plane about a frontal axis. An example is shown at the elbow. Flexion occurs when the angle between two adjacent segments in the body decreases as the ventral surfaces of the segments approximate each other and occurs in a sagittal plane about a frontal axis. An example is shown at the knee. Abduction and adduction are movements in the frontal plane and involve moving the body part away or towards an imaginary center line. Abduction is taking the body away from the central line and adduction or adduction is moving it towards that line. An example of this is shown at the hip. Rotation movements are in the transverse plane and include any twisting motion. Joints which permit rotation include the shoulder and hip. There are also joint specific movement descriptors. For instance, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion refer to extension or flexion of the foot at the ankle joint. Another example is pronation and supination, which refer generally to the prone facing down or supine facing up positions. Finally, we also have inversion and eversion, which refer to movements that tilt the sole of the foot away from or towards the midline of the body, respectively. Next, we will provide a brief introduction to conducting an assessment of functional anatomy. Note that this is not comprehensive. Indeed, you will spend not only the rest of this module, but many others in your course learning how to conduct a clinical assessment.
An examination might typically begin with an assessment of the patient's posture, joint motion and strength. Once this is completed, we might systematically observe the patient's dynamic posture during a task, for example, or a functional movement such as their walking gait. This examination is intended to be systematic. Palpation of relevant anatomical structures might also occur. We will cover some of these in greater detail in later classes, but for now I will focus a little more on the inspection component. The clinician should inspect the patient's posture from the front, both sides and back, looking for any asymmetries or signs of injury. Things to focus on are summarised in the following inspection checklist. General posture, shoulder height, both should be symmetrical, spinal alignment, arm position, the pelvis with particular focus on the anterior and posterior superior iliac spines, and the gluteal folds. The heights of these structures should be symmetrical. The hip, whether it is in internal or external rotation, and the greater trochanters, whether there is genu varus, genu valgus, patellar tilt, or genu recurvatum, for example. Tibial varus should be identified, and lower extremity joint alignment should be assessed. There may be external tibial torsion, heel varus or valgus, foot pronation or supination, pes cavus or pes planus, otherwise known as high arch or flat foot postures, a toe in or toe out stance and forefoot deformities such as a bunion. These are just examples. The most common static abnormality associated with gait-related injury is limb length discrepancy. Visual estimation of limb length difference is best done at this stage of the examination. If a leg length discrepancy exists, one hip usually appears lower than the other. If any asymmetry appears to be present, careful leg length measurements should be taken. One simple technique for doing so entails ensuring the pelvis is level and then measuring the distance from the anterior superior iliac spine to the medial malleolus while the patient lies supine. If the pelvis is not level, pelvic rotation can cause a pseudo leg length inequality when measurements are taken. Next, the assessment of joint range of motion. We will cover this in greater detail later, but for now, it is enough for you to know normal range of motion is needed for smooth, symmetric movement and to help dissipate ground reaction forces. Inadequate motion at any joint within a closed kinetic chain unavoidably leads to the transfer of ground reaction forces to other sites within that chain, a process that may contribute to injury. Range of motion is typically assessed using open chain movements while the patient is seated or lying on an examination table. We will be discussing how to assess range of motion in the joint specific lectures. However, for now, it is enough to say that motion of joints such as the hips, knees, ankles and the first metatarsophalangeal joint should be assessed. Assessment of joint motion necessarily entails some assessment of flexibility of the muscles that move the joint in question. However, more focused assessment of a muscle or muscle group may be needed and will be reviewed in our joint specific lectures. When assessing joint motion, keep in mind the effect of major muscles that cross two joints. As an example, knee flexion is restricted by the rectus femoris if the hip is simultaneously extended, as the rectus femoris crosses both the knee and the hip. Likewise, ankle motion is affected by knee extension or flexion, as the gastrocnemius crosses both the ankle and the knee. The clinician needs to distinguish between joint motion limitations due to soft tissue constraints versus mechanical restrictions, for instance joint diffusion, meniscal tear or bone spurs. Applications for obtaining angular measurements and other mechanical analyses are available. We will be using one such simple approach, goniometry, in a later lecture. The upshot of all of this is that these strategies allow us to get a picture of the physical condition of the patient. All that is left for us to do is to communicate effectively. Skilled and appropriate communication is the foundation of effective practice and is a key professional competence which is highly valued by patients and clients. Effective communication does not only improve understanding between health professionals and patients, but it can also have a positive impact on health outcomes. For example, communication may be therapeutic meaning a physiotherapist who validates the patient's perspective or expresses empathy may help a patient experience improved psychological well-being. This may lead to the patient experiencing fewer negative emotions like fear and anxiety 
and more positive ones like hope, optimism and self-worth. While this module is primarily intended to provide you with an introduction to assessment, it would be worth your while to remain cognizant of how you communicate with your subject as it will stand to you in the long run. And that concludes this lecture introducing you to the fundamental topics of functional anatomy. In this lecture, we reviewed those fundamental topics and briefly outlined some of the assessment techniques that you will be using in this module. This lecture was prepared for students enrolled in the UCD School of Public Health, Physiotherapy and Sports Science. Images were taken from the complete anatomy software prepared by 3D for medical.